I was born in 1328 and grew up in a time when China was having a bit of a pest problem. They were everywhere. Wherever you looked, there was ceaseless death and destruction. They were like an invasive species, occupiers that weren't where they belonged and were making everybody's lives slightly more god-awful than they already were. They were known as the Mongols. Ruled by a man named Kublai Khan, they rode in on horses in massive clusters like locusts, ready for a feast at our expense. When they took over and took our freedom away, they tried to keep us from uprising, and the best idea they had was to name their dynasty something that they thought would fit into our society. That name was the Yuan Dynasty. Life during the Yuan Dynasty was miserable for the native Chinese. It was like listening to Elvis on loop for 10 hours straight. Taxes increased and the military presence in China was, greater, was greatly raised. We were split into strict social classes and were on the bottom rung. Impoverished and hungry, this is where my story really started. All right, see, that's, that's got to change. There we go. Sorry, I had to th do a bit of a throwback there. All right. Now let me tell you how a peasant boy became the emperor of China. There was this big series of natural disasters a few years in a row, and I was a victim of one of those disasters. You see, there had been a lot of flash floods, and this river, the Huai River, that ran through Fangyang, where I lived, see, back then we called it Hao, but, so if you're going to do your own independent research, you have to compare a lot of old and modern maps. It flooded in 1344 when I was 16, and my brother and I, we were orphaned. We were orphaned during a period where there was already a lot of economic trouble, not only because of the natural disasters, but also because of the, the Mongols had been raising taxes to fund their military expansion, even after the colossal failure that had been the Japanese invasion. In this period of just utter social chaos among us lower class citizens, we really only had one option, religion. Now, I know this sounds preachy and all, like I found God and saved my soul, but in reality, it just meant moving into a Buddhist monastery because nowhere else had food. We stayed there until we were fully grown, and then, when we were in our mid-twenties, we started hearing about rebellions. There was this new group in town that called themselves the Red Turbans. They had a kid who they claimed to be descended from the Song bloodline, but that's all he was, a kid. His name was Han Linner, and while he wasn't actually anybody important, he was the big figurehead of the revolutionary movement and our unofficial emperor. Anyways, they had the same ideologies as this group called the White Lotus Society from a long time ago, but these guys were essentially declaring their own government. Of course, I enlisted right away. I joined in, I want to say, 1352. Yeah, because it was a year earlier when the whole thing with the Han Liner had come up after this big uprising in Yingzhou. I found myself on that side of the rebellion, working for the kid emperor and the person actually running the show, Lu Fu Tong. Now came the tricky part. I had gotten some education out of my time at the monastery, but not a lot, so to be able to work my way up the military chain of command would take personal strategic talent and charisma, the kind that doesn't come from a book. Fortunately, <laughs> I've got more talent and charisma than that person on every season of America's Got Talent that should have won. In just a short while, I became Lu's top general. Then, in 1355, I had a serious decision to make. That year, I engaged the Mongols at the city of Nanjing. If I could win the battle, it would be the Red Turban's first military victory. As you can probably tell by the fact that I still have my head, I was able to beat back the Mongols. With that foothold, I was able to drive them out of southern China. Content with this victory, for the time, I decided to do what the Red Turbans had always done best, and create a new faction. I became what you might call a warlord, but back in my day, you would have called it whatever we told you to, because, you know, warlord. I saw this new independence as the leader of a sect of the rebellion as an opportunity to take a look at what would come next. With the Mongols driven out of southern China and myself as the big hero responsible, I had a certain public image, wanting to keep this image clean, and favorable, I took on a handful of advisors. Essentially, what they told me to do next would be treason. They told me to distance myself from the Red Turban movement so that I would be seen as less of an idealistic conqueror and more as a ruler. I would be abandoning the cause which I had fought for for five years at that point. Some of you might be asking what they could have possibly told me I could gain by doing this. The rest of you get a gold star for doing your research before coming here. They told me, 
that once the Mongols were wholly driven from China, somebody would have to be in charge. It could be anybody. It could be me. A peasant who was born into nothing had, for only the second time in all of history at that point, the opportunity to become an emperor, the founder of a new dynasty. I turned a page and began a new chapter in my life. I began by gaining the support of the people. Like I said, you would have called me whatever I wanted, and right then, I didn't want to be called their emperor. I still needed the support of those red turbans who were keeping me in power militarily, so I pledged allegiance to Han Liner and to the Song Dynasty, which he represented. I settled for being the Duke of Nanjing, my future capital city. Over the course of the next few years, though, I built up to a final conflict where I systematically removed all rivals from my path. I won't bore you with the details, but I will brag that I won one of the largest naval battles in history at Lake Poyang against Chen Youling. Now, the Mongols still had full control of northern China, but they had cracked down harder on law and order, that of course meaning their law and order. After seeing how I pushed them as far back as I did, meanwhile when I did so, the South was in utter chaos. It took me over a decade to get the South properly cleaned up, but once I had all of Free China under my thumb, it was time to tie up one last loose end. You see, in 1367, the Mongols had been threatening an attack on Chuzhou, Han Liner's capital, and wanting to protect my emperor, I sent one of my most trusted advisors to escort him into safer territory. It was shortly thereafter that I received shocking news. While under the care of my advisor, a boat which Han Liner had been aboard capsized, and the would-be emperor drowned. Whoops. <laughs> There is no greater martyr than a monarch declaring a racial revolution, and with this law still fresh in the hearts of all the people of free China, I rallied tremendous support, and we pushed northward. In January 1368, I made my direct assault on the UN capital of Dadu. The very presence of my armies in northern China was enough to send the UN emperor into retreat. Entering Dadu, I destroyed the Mongol palaces, which remained as a sign that they had once been there. The Mongols drew back all the way uh, out of China. I was in full control of the country, and on January 23rd, 1368, I declared the formation of a new Chinese empire. All of the provinces of China, as well as the vast state of Korea, were now under a, a new dynastic rule. I didn't like the old system of naming a dynasty after my home province. After all, I hadn't exactly expanded from there, and my purpose was never to form the Hao dynasty but rather just to topple the UN. I chose instead a name which meant brilliant light. With a name change of my own to mean great marshal, I became Hong Wu, emperor of the Ming dynasty. My name is Hong Wu, peasant born emperor of China. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs>